All right. Hello. We have gone live. Hello. Hey, Lucinda, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Um, so you might find that there's a lot of um, changes to the lighting situation at the moment, um, owing to me working with natural light and <laughs> being a bit of a cloudy, sunny day. So <laughs> if I look a bit ominous at any point, you'll know why. <laughs> Um, so thanks everyone for joining us for our second self-care session um, we had some really lovely warm feedback from our last session which was with Kate Bishop um, a life and well-being coach um, if you missed out on that you can go back and watch it it's up on our YouTube channel um, and yeah thank you for for joining us again if you are joining us again we might be talking into the ether who knows <laughs> um, so Today's session will again consist of three sections. So we'll start with a chat with our guest who's coming on shortly. Then we'll be moving on to a demo of a self massage and stretching sequence um, that will be focusing on an area chosen by our guest. Um, and then we'll have time for some questions. So if you do have anything that you want to ask either ourselves, um, myself and Lucinda, or Elika, who was our guest, please feel free to pop those in the comments and we'll try to get around to them. Uh, if you're not able to tune in live, do feel free to drop us an email and we'll try and get back to anyone who has any questions there as well. So um, this week we're joined by Elika Ashuri, who is a British Iranian actress. Elika graduated from Kent University in 2008 and she studied uh, uh, art, history and drama. She then went on to study acting at Rose Bruford. Um, but since 2015, Elika has spent most of her time setting up um, a cake business, which is now a very successful artisan patisserie. So she has a stall in Greenwich Market, or at least she did prior to lockdown, and she'll take us through that trajectory when she comes on. Um, she also caters for weddings, high-end luxury events. And on top of that, Alika still pursues acting, modeling. She sets up projects for um, sustainable, eco-friendly fashion and collaborates with small businesses to support um, buying locally and eco ecologically. So we'll be talking to Alika about all of that shortly. Uh, we'll also talk about how cooking and baking can have um, some therapeutic benefits, either whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're receiving home-baked goods from other people. Um, we'd like to mention that this week will be a very special episode. Um, Elika will be kindly talking to us about some of the personal struggles she and her family are going through as they try to free her father Anushe, who has been wrongfully imprisoned in Iran. So we're very honoured that she'll be able to talk to us about that and hopefully um, she'll be able to tell us how we can help and um, that that will be something that we can get involved in. So please do listen in on that and pitch in if you can. So you can see at the bottom we've got our little PayPal link which is there. If you can and want to make a donation, we would greatly appreciate it. It's split equally between Pamela Need, the guest this week, Elika, and the nominated charity of the week, which is chosen by the guest. So this week's uh, charity chosen by Elika is HSI, which is the Humane Society International. And this is a leading force for animal protection. So there are campaigns to protect British wildlife, to stop the use and the sale of fur, to reduce animal suffering on farms and to stop animals being used in scientific research and product testing. Um, and this is a cause that will be very close to many people's hearts. We all, well, a lot of us have pets or have an affinity with animals and the concept of any cruelty happening to animals is unbearable. So, um, Again, if you feel like you can donate, it'll be appreciated. But if you can't, go and check out the website and amplify it or support it in whatever way is possible for you. OK, so um, before we bring Elika on for a chat, I'll have a quick chat with Lucinda, my lovely colleague. Um, so, Lucinda, how are you this week? Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good, actually. Um, I was suffering a bit with the heat sort of the last few days when we had that massive heat wave but yeah I'm much more relaxed it's now a little bit 
Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not very good in the heat. I'm a little bit pale. Tensions <laughs> run high when it's hot, I think, especially when you're yeah, in lockdown. <laughs> our household was a very tense. Because yeah, there's three of you. You've got, yeah, um, got a dog who doesn't like the heat much either, do you? <laughs> no, he's a black dog and he suffers. So he was Aww. panting and didn't know what to do with himself. And How's the hair situation? It's all right. I've given him a good shave. Um, <laughs> got the clippers out, gave him a good shave. And he, he, he wasn't very impressed, but he's a bit oh. too less, so it's all good. All good. He Fantastic. Is, he is coping. <laughs> oh, bless. <laughs> um, and Lucinda, um, I suppose a lot of people are asking me at the moment about massage and um, when it'll mm. be coming back because of course we had the in the UK the government guidelines this week were that certain businesses will return on the 4th of July um, with some restrictions but of course massage isn't included in that um, so what are you telling people who are wondering when they can next have their much awaited massage much needed massage <laughs> Yeah, it's very tricky, isn't it? Because I think a lot of colleagues, including ourselves, sort of anticipated that we would be going back on the 4th um, with the hairdressers and um, with the reopening of those sort of salons. So it is it is difficult. Um, I think we've got to just exercise a bit of patience. We're, you know, closely following sort of the government guidelines. And unfortunately, a lot of people do say to us, oh, can't you just do a treatment at home or something if... if if your establishment, for instance, my gym where I normally work is closed at the moment, can't you do a few treatments at home? But unfortunately, we're not covered by our insurance. Mm. So it's, it's impossible for us because obviously we, we have to have certain liability insurance and uh, which protects the client and ourselves from anything that would go wrong. So, um, you know, it's, it's for both of your, our sakes, whether it's COVID related or not, we can't really treat when we, we're not covered. So I think we're just going to have to uh, keep on doing these live streams, see, yeah. <laughs> see what happens in the next few weeks. Hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be able to do um, some treatments, even if they are just sort of from from home or, or you know, um, not as uh, not as many as we can normally do. Because as well, there'll be lots of when we do eventually come back, there'll be probably quite a few things we're going to have to adhere to, like wearing the PPE having big gaps between appointments and things like that just to try and keep people safe so mm. yeah watch this space everyone we're really really we're working yeah. with our users, trying to trying to get back so people can have a have a treatment but um, yeah not safety that. first <laughs> Exactly. Absolutely. <laughs> I think when when we do start back, there'll be a lot of people with a lot of built up tension. So um, <laughs> yeah, people are, people form an orderly messaging, queue. <laughs> messaging me saying they're dying for treatment. They just can't oh. wait. For and and we're dying to treat you guys as well because for us, it's our you know it's our passion. We love to do it. We you know as sports therapists, it's it's uh you know it's something that we we really enjoy so yeah but but hopefully the self-massage demonstrations that we show you in a little while will will help to alleviate some of those aches and pains yeah absolutely, absolutely. and we do have um we do have our 12 episodes uh working from home massage yeah. series as well so if you if you do want to go and check that out there's um sort of something for almost every part of the body that you might you might want to have a look at if you're suffering with tension or stress mm. or muscle aches and pains have a look um and that might kind of keep you going until you can have your actual proper full body massage again hopefully soon <laughs> exactly. yeah. uh cool so um elika we're going to bring you in now and one, two, three, four, five. Here she comes. I should have counted backwards. That's how you do it. I'm not a very professional at this. <laughs> at least I gave you warning. <laughs> cool. And I am going to, um, I will disappear into the background for a little while while you guys have a chat. We'll see you in a while, Lucinda. Hello, Alika. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us on this um, changeable, sunny, rainy Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> We're going to have very different lights throughout our podcast. So. We will, yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting, dramatic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's what we do. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Alika, um, 
how has lockdown been for you? Um, contrary to most people, I think lockdown's been a very th therapeutic cleansing experience for me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, you know, if you take the hot, like a horrible dark side of things, you know, out of the equation, for me, I think it was a much needed break from, you know, my daily just grind and because of the sheer amount of work that I have every day and um, uh, just, you know, the, the, the workload that uh, market acting, modeling, everything was like bringing to my life. Uh, I really didn't know how to put the brakes on and say enough is enough and just like work, work creates work. So I had gone to a point where, you know, I was having three months of work with no days off. And yeah, when the lockdown came, I remember the first day that I woke up after the lockdown, I was like, I cannot believe that there's, I have nothing to do. It's a weird <laughs> feeling for me. You don't have to set an alarm. You don't have to I, go anywhere. It was kind of like a feeling you get where you're kind of guilty after like your first day of summer after school where you think, oh God, I have nothing to do. Yeah. Like, this is weird. <laughs> and, um, yeah. It actually made me um, a, really tap into my creative side. And, you know, because, you know, I do work in a creative industry. All the industries I work in are quite creative. But as you know yourself as an actress, you know, it can become quite tedious. Uh, mm -hmm. at times when you repeat the same things day in and day out and it's mostly labor intensive and it can block your creativity to some extent you know people might look at it and think it's very glamorous but um you know after a while you you know that you've been doing the same thing day in day out and it, it sucks the life out of you so the lockdown has actually given me a chance to explore my creativity is the things that I want to do and not be completely at the mercy of uh, work and customers and just really explore the things I've never had time to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, more people will, I suppose once people they got over the initial shock of lockdown, more people started to um, embrace their creative side for some people, maybe for the first time ever. Um, and it's, yeah. I suppose not that you want to think about lockdown as having silver linings because of course you know there's people who have sadly passed away or people who've had severe hardship during lockdown um but as humans we do have to try and always find a bright side where we can and if the bright side that came out of it is that um you know a few, people were able to have a little bit more time with books or music or art or whatever it is that is is your outlet um maybe discovering something that will that you will be able to carry with you after your lockdown that's that's surely a good thing so you kind of yeah try and look at the positive sides where where you can <laughs> yeah absolutely and you know because you're not going out you're not spending money going out transport meeting friends you know, you have to make the best of this situation. Um, you know, I, for the first few days, I was kind of just resting and hibernating. But uh, <laughs> when, um, when, you know, you come to think of things, you think, okay, uh, this is the situation now. Uh, it's out of my control. And um, what can I do with what's currently uh, provided to me by life? <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, I did a lot of DIY around the house, which I think most people did. Which is like, <laughs> you go around your house all day looking and thinking, oh, I wish this shelf was here and I wish that was there and this was removed. And so I thought, why not? I YouTube it and I do it. Because yeah. You don't feel guilty about doing wasting your time on things like, you know, usually you don't have time <laughs> yeah, for. Exactly. And, um, and, um, and I started learning a language, which, you know, everybody said you have to do. And, um, you know, the, my other language, Farsi, is not a very useful language. So, you know, when I say that I'm bilingual, it doesn't really mean that, you know, I know two languages that can get me far in life. <laughs> you know? um, so, yeah, I've always wanted to learn French. And uh, I've actually used these um, months of lockdown and I've actually dedicated about three hours a day to learning <laughs> French. Oh, wow. Wow. Well so, done. Fair play. Yeah, why not? Why not? Yeah. I um, looked at a drop down of my phone and how I use my time. And I realized I do spend a lot of time on social media. And I thought if I even have that, and instead of three hours on social media, I spent three hours on something that, you know, you, you take something from. 
Mm. It's it's uh, it's really rewarding because you you finish you at the end of the day you look at your day and you think you know I couldn't work I couldn't do this and that but what have I done with the time that was given to me? Absolutely, and, uh, and yeah. Alika, I know um, you said obviously you you haven't been able to work. How how has lockdown impacted you? Because I know um, that you are self employed and you're a small scale freelancer and you you know you work in the market and you provide um, artisan baked goods to people. So what has the impact been on you um, in that respect? Well, at the beginning, it was difficult because uh, obviously um, the spring springtime for me is wedding season. And uh, I cater for a lot of weddings, cakes, macarons. Um, and from end of March, I think, I started getting emails that everything's been postponed to the year after. And obviously that's a big chunk of my business that's kind of being delayed. And um, the market obviously shut down. And uh, for the first few weeks, I actually couldn't get hold of ingredients because I, you know. With, yeah, oh yeah, you couldn't get flour or eggs for love nor money. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and that's what my business is based on. And um, a lot of stores, even wholesale stores, limited their products to, you know, one or two items per person. And oh, I'm the person who go and, you know, buy three kilos of this and 10 kilos of that. So people would look at me funny if I was doing that. <laughs> Greedy girl. <laughs> exactly. And um, yeah, it's uh, it was really challenging. But um, luckily, I had some money saved. So, you know, I, um, I could... Um, Kind of go on with that a bit my partner had some money saved so we were okay for a bit but then i i actually used that time to make cakes or make desserts that i don't normally get to do and mm. actually it was a really good opportunity for me to remodel my business because okay. um when when you get order after order a lot of them don't allow you to uh pursue your own style um, you you can't really put your stamp on things where people show you something from Pinterest or some picture that they've seen at someone's party. They don't really, um, it doesn't really allow you to explore what you want your look to be. Um, and this actually allowed me to have a platform where I could um, just try things out, you know, get um, polystyrene cake dummies and just try out different things with my cakes and things that I want to do so that by the end of this I could have a portfolio to show people that um, my work is this and this is a type of thing that I will provide and if you like it then the, we are the right match as clients mm. and uh, myself. Yeah, and fantastic. I think that was really important for me because um, I one of my main um, aims as as a cake designer, macaron artist, is to kind of it's to convey the the picture that uh, my work is art. You know, I get a lot of uh, problems with people who want me to make a cake for them for very little money, because supermarkets and other places do so. Mm. And um, I think it, it, every artist needs a portfolio, and um, every artist also needs to make a living. So when you have to do the things, that, you know, in terms of acting, you know, you do lots of adverts, you do lots of things that you don't want to do because you have to make the money. And you really want to have that little time, like a little opportunity where you can do the things you like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, one for the pocket and one for the soul. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, it's a really, it's a really fine line to, to that balance, to get to that balance where you're doing things you like yeah. and actually making money from it. So, yeah, this was a good, a good opportunity for me to explore and see what I like. Because, you know, mm. sometimes you don't even get to think what you like or what you, you're you happy making. And, um, you know, yeah, there's only so many pepper Pig cakes and <laughs> pepper pig cakes you can make before you have enough. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's been good. I, it's funny you say that. I, I wonder if... Um coming out of this if people will be more interested in having homemade bespoke goods rather than just what's available from a supermarket because over obviously the past three months we've kind of been restricted in terms of what we can access um, and it would be nice to think that coming out of lockdown there might be a resurge in interest in artisan goods whether that's baked goods or art or clothing likewise I know that um 
you work quite a lot with um, creating awareness of local support and sustainable eco-friendly clothing as well and that's something that is quite important to you I think. Yeah I mean if there's something that lockdown has shown us is that we don't need to rely on supermarkets we don't need to rely on big chains to um, provide food uh, as you've seen you know with the banana breads and uh, yeah. homemade sourdough <laughs> Asra, yeah, and people started to get creative. And even if they didn't know before that they had it in them, you know, now they do. And, uh, you you know, not only that, is that they find that it's so rewarding to make something by yourself that you would previously have bought and paid a lot more for it. And the taste, that you compromise the taste because, you know, something that's homemade and if you master it, it's so superior to what you buy in a supermarket. Mm. And um, uh, not only that, I think um, the fact that um, people, um, you know, appreciate the work that goes into making things. Because um, if no one's ever made cake before, I actually had a few people approach me um, and said, actually, now I understand why you get so offended by people questioning your prices. Yeah. <laughs> making a tiniest, simplest cake could at least cost you 20 pounds in ingredients and equipment and yeah. not to take the time or the effort or the skill that goes in it so i think the lockdown has provided people i think hopefully with the perspective that you know it's not just something you buy it's 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 not a product it's skill set it's uh, years of um, practice and acquiring those skills that you're paying for Absolutely. Yeah. So important. Um, and Delika, I, I know you say that obviously um, baking takes a lot of time and I'm by no means a domestic goddess. Would you have any <laughs> tips for someone who's very nervous about approaching baking, someone who thinks, oh, I just can't do it? I mean, where would you start? What would be a sort of a go-to thing for someone to start out with? I mean, anything that you fancy. I Before I started making my macarons I was so afraid to make them because they are notoriously difficult to make and um, I think the key is to not be afraid of making mistakes because uh, a lot of us you know for the first time that we do something and um, it doesn't go right we get really disheartened and we kind of give up yeah but I think there is fun in making mistakes because you know it's a learning curve I don't see it as mistakes I see it as opportunities that teaches you that next time you will eliminate those mistakes and you try something new and in the process maybe you invent something or you come up with something and you know mm. most great things happen by accident right <laughs> so I think if you want to start I mean if you like cakes uh, you know YouTube is a sea of opportunity. I, I never went to a course for my myself. I never really did courses to make cake or decorate things. You know, I studied acting and drama and history. So it was just a hobby that I thought maybe if I cultivated and like work on it, it could be something. And it was literally just through YouTube, watching videos, reading books that you start to play around. And when you kind of master those basic techniques, then you you get more confident, like anything, like learning a language, or like even your your job. You know, make you may, I'm mm. sure you were nervous giving your first massage. Oh that. my god, and it was terrible. I'm sure <laughs> yeah. whoever my first guinea pig was probably came out thinking, "What was that?" <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you were part of it at the time, you know, because yeah, that's, the, that's the, the level that you are, and then you know you get better, and then you look at your previous works and you think, oh. That was awful. I mean, when I look at my first macarons, I think, oh my God, did I actually sell those? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I think just don't be afraid. If, if you like cakes, YouTube how to make cakes, how to make a basic cake and just go for it. It's not difficult. And, you know, if it goes wrong, then you just have the batter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's not a disaster. <laughs> like chocolate buy a book on making chocolate on amazon yeah. you, know, you can buy these books for like 10 pence and um <laughs> yeah. you, know, you just you just do it it's fun like anything yeah no that's that's so important to remember i mean i suppose uh, 
a failure isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's only through failure and mistakes that we can learn. And, and you know, if all you learn is that actually you don't have the patience to make a cake, then <laughs> Elika's here. <laughs> Go to Lilika's treats instead. <laughs> Which may well be my um, <laughs> course of action, but we'll see. <laughs> I think that's me after the lockdown for a massage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you told me you've been having some interesting um, bespoke massages at home. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, my partner is um, famously awful for giving <laughs> massages. Um, and he's, he gets tired after, I think, without exaggeration, 20 seconds. <laughs> so, he would actually, that what we discovered that would put him past that 20 second threshold is if we get a pestle and mortar and use, the, use that on my back when it's <laughs> that's original <laughs> I know <laughs> that's what we kind of like extended it to maybe two minutes oh fantastic but, um, yeah I think I would definitely need to visit you <laughs> after lockdown for a real pestle I'll bring it <laughs> do please we'll do a swap that would be fantastic look forward to it <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, and speaking of going to visit people or see people, we've not been able to do that for a long time. And I know that that's something that um, is quite difficult and a lot of people struggle with not having that connection with people um, and particularly with families. So, you know, a lot of us have not been able to see our family and become very aware of how important it is to, you know, Zoom is fine, but actually being able to see people or give people a hug is a huge thing. Um, and that brings me on to the, the next thing that we wanted to talk about. Um, and you've kindly agreed to speak about um, your father, Anushe. Um, so do you want to just kind of take us through um, the situation that your father and your family have found themselves in? Sure. I mean, uh, my dad went back for a really routine visit to Iran, which we normally did, all of us as a family. You know, I, I went back... Um, my mother went back because we have grandparents there and um, he um, he went to visit his mother who uh, was having a knee surgery and he, she needed someone to take care of her for a few weeks. So my dad went there and um, on the last in the last week that he was there, he went out shopping uh, one day and uh, we never heard from him that day. And um, we found later on that uh, bunch of guys uh, went to him in a van and asked if he was Anusha Ashuri and he said yes and they actually put a bag over his head and uh, huddled him into a van and um, then they took him to uh, Tehran's most notoriously awful prison which is Evin and um, they told him that he was being charged with uh, spying for Israel which was I mean we found out all of this four months later we had no idea what was going on and um we only knew that he was taken because the when my grandmother went home uh, he found a note that my dad had written saying i'm going to a friend's house uh and i won't be back tonight which is uh, extremely strange because my dad is a type of person who would tell you where he's every minute of the day he, mm. he's very you know he's very connected and he he never likes to know. He likes to know where we are all the time because he's worried. Yeah. And um, my mom thought something might be up, but, you know, not in a million years we thought that could have happened. And um, the next day he, he, had, uh, he was allowed to call my nan and tell her that he was arrested for some charges and that he, would, uh, he's co he was cooperating that he would be out soon. And that was the last we heard from him for another few weeks. And we all kind of felt like, do we go back? Um, you know, do we do we wait? What's happening? You know, why the hell has this happened? We all thought, you know, we started to question ourselves. I thought, did I do something in my acting field that was political maybe? But I was going back and looking at all my acting experiences and thinking maybe that's why they, he's been arrested. And um, my mom was questioning her work because she's a translator. And, you know, we all had, like, we, we were all confused. And... Um, after a few weeks, he rang again, uh, he rang my grandmother again and said, um, there are a few men that are going to come to the house because my dad is retired now. So all mm -hmm. of his files, all of his business related things are at my grandmother's house. He said, if they come, uh, give them anything that they need. 
so that they see that I'm innocent and there's a misunderstanding and hopefully this will be over soon. And this is August 2017 that I'm talking about. Um, and the men came, took everything. And we didn't hear from him for another four months where we found out that he was being kept in solitary confinement. And um, as after those four months, he was transferred to the political prisoners ward in Ebbing. And uh, they, were, they told him that he was going to be charged with uh, spying. But to this day, um, they haven't found any proof, any evidence, anything that he was spying and actually charged him after a year of him being there because he kept being rejected access to lawyers, access to consulate, access to anything really. And um, when they actually finally took him to court, which I use the term court very loosely, it's just a chamber yeah. with a judge and his interrogator, they uh, told him that because there is there is a sentence or there's there's a potential for him to be a spy that they are going to charge him to 10 years in jail because he could potentially become a spy and that if we were to go to iran we would be arrested because as they use the term sleeper cells that we are that and that's how they just um imprisoned him and later we found that the whole thing that Iran has a very, um, very long history of uh, hostage taking as a form of business. And they have done for, you know, a long time, for 40 years since the Islamic Revolution, that's, you know, the, the first act of the Islamic Revolution was taking hostages in the American embassy. And uh, as, as we've seen in the film Argo. <laughs> yeah. Think, um, um, so, yeah, it's, um, it's been going on for a while. And, um, they keep prisoners because there's something they need from the country of their residents as Iran doesn't accept dual nationality. So they found a very convenient loophole where they arrest dual nationals that they target and think they would fit the criteria that they're looking for and would ask the country of their other residents, so UK in our case, for the demands that they need for it and in my dad's case and in Mrs. Radcliffe's case. So it's very, I think she's in a very similar case to mm. my dad. Um, they need, um, there's a 400 million pound debt that the UK owes uh, Iran. And um, it was, uh, it, the money was given to the UK pre-revolution, so over 40 years ago. And Iran wants this money back, but obviously they're not going through diplomatic routes, obviously, to get this yeah. money. Back. <laughs> Heaven yeah. forbid. <laughs> yeah. And um, the UK, um, in response, is refusing to accept that these two are linked. So we are caught in a catch-22 of Iran asking or making these demands and the UK really not cooperating. So we are stuck between two very stubborn governments as uh, pawns basically as a chess and it's not just me it's just not my family it's not my dad there are mm. about 12 british dual nationals that are currently in evan and in total i think around 60 dual nationals from all over the world that are there and negotiations are being made um like the us um, has managed to free two of their hostages by the mm. but there isn't any international um coalition no one internationally is forming an alliance to um speak about this there's no voice internationally to say this is wrong and it, there needs to be a law or a bill that needs to be passed to stop or prevent this from happening they barely yeah. even recognize it so wow that's it. <laughs> yeah i mean i'm sure there's a lot there's a lot more to it that you you could talk about um but yeah i mean and if people want to help in any way um i know that your family have a petition um it, it, can people sign or how can people amplify the cause or help uh yeah i mean if you google my dad's name anusha shuri it will straight away the first um uh, search that comes up is our petition to um free him and i think it's had uh, over fifty thousand signatures so far oh fantastic and, uh, yeah, and we're trying to raise that by obviously going public, talking about it, because for the first year we didn't go public because uh, we were scared that it would change the, it would affect uh, his sentencing and it mm. would affect his conditions there. 
and then we talk to the foreign office and they advise us to stay silent right but uh, because they thought that they could solve things diplomatically and behind the scenes but after you know a year of waiting around um we realized that nothing that no progress was being made and actually iran was first to publicize my dad's case because obviously what's the point of taking a hostage if they're not they're unknown so i think they they tired they tired of us waiting like they tired of waiting for us to go public so they publicized it so we had to take control of the narrative and um uh pub, do our own publicity so now we're kind of at a Unfortunately, we got hit by Brexit, elections, <laughs> coronavirus. So, yeah, it's not been a great year. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's 2020 can just, uh, can we just press year. rewind, maybe? Exactly, or forward. <laughs> or forward, idea. yeah, either. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, so hopefully now that things have settled a little bit, we have managed to get in the front seat of our... Um, you know, media um, activities and uh, mm. hopefully push this case a bit forward and get people to sign so that we could hopefully put enough pressure on the British government to take action. Because um, if we don't, they are refusing to. They're, they're not acknowledging us. They didn't even, actually, when we first went there, one of the first things that they said in regards to helping my dad um, and giving him diplomatic immunity because then he would get access to you know uh, a lot more than he is now they said that we had to determine his britishness all right <laughs> we didn't even know we found it really offensive because we've been naturalized and we're british my parents grew up and studied here and uh, lived here we studied here we work here we pay taxes so we've already gone through a process with the home office to qualify for a british passport but they the whole the foreign office now says that they don't have access to those documents because they don't exist anymore and that we need to prove again how british we are in order for them to help us any further wow well if there's one thing we've learned of recent times is that the british home office is less than competent unless it suits it so yeah and the yeah. British government is <laughs> 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 I don't think anyone will argue. <laughs> no, <I hope> <laughs> well, Alika, thank you so much for talking about that. Um, and yeah. anyone who is tuning into this, um, whether you're tuning in live or you tune in later, please, please do um, Google. Um, you can see at the bottom of the screen, we've got his name, Anusha Shure, and you can um, sign the petition and amplify the, the case and put a little bit more pressure on the government and hopefully... Um, sooner rather than later Elika's family have their dad home again with them um, thank you so much Elika for talking about that yeah fingers crossed um, and Elika um, you just seem to have a million things going on another thing that is very close to your heart and it's the charity that we're donating to this week is HSI can you tell us about how you became familiar with HSI and what it means to you um well, I became familiar with them uh, when I had a top up pop up shop in uh, Shoreditch, and um, their offices were on my walk path every morning. And um, um, their adverts and stuff, and obviously, as our Instagram listens to all we say, their adverts started to pop up on my Instagram. And I, I got really curious, and I um, read about them, and I, the things that they support um, t were really close to my heart. I'm a really massive animal lover and um, what they do is that they uh, one of the main things they do that um, caught my attention was that they go to South Korea and um, in South Korea there's a really big um, dog farming scene where they they don't um, breed dogs so to speak they steal people's pets and take them to um, these animal farms where they then breed them, uh, crossbreed them for meat. Oh, God. Um, yeah, and there are many, many farmers. And it's not a particularly legal process either, but it's a very black market behind the scene um, activity that's happening. And um, uh, they, they, what Humane Society International does is 
they go there because obviously these farmers, I mean, as, as hor horrible as this is, the people's livelihood depend on it. And mm -hmm. um, there's no, um, there's no way of shutting these farms down without compensation for the farmers to go and start farming in other fields. So what they do is they go and negotiate with the farmers and they negotiate the release of these dogs in exchange for the other avenues. And I found that very admirable. And um, I find the um, other efforts very admirable. Like they are, they, they tirelessly uh, try to put a ban on the Yulin Dog Festival in China, which is a really barbaric um, tradition where they torch dogs um, you know, in markets and sell the meat and kill, you know, skin them alive. It's just horrible. And um, they, yeah, they, so they, they do a lot in terms of that. And they also do a lot in terms of, um, you know, any animal cruelty. They are extremely um, active in um, uh, anim uh, going to uh, lab laboratories where they have animal testing and they free those dogs and they shut those labs down. Wow. And yeah, that and they they go to places where uh, animals are used for their skin for their fur, and they they shut those places down. And what I like about them is that they are a very small group of um, people who run this charity in the UK. And um, I know them personally. I they actually uh, I hadn't met them the first time that I did a fundraising for them. I I just spoke to them via email and phone, but. Um, one day when I was at my store, one of the ladies who works there actually came to me and introduced herself. And oh, wow. that, you know, they, they came to me and uh, invited me to their offices. So I actually went there and had, uh, you know, drinks with them in oh, nice. office, and coffee. And uh, yeah, and um, we have actually built a relationship that's not strictly um, through email. Uh, I actually know them and... Um, I know personally that what they do is um, admirable and mm. honest and the money that we donate to these charities actually goes to a good cause. I mean, to date, I think they've closed down close to 40 dog farms in South Korea. Wow, fantastic. And, yeah. yeah, so, um, you know, they really help rehome these dogs and these animals that they get from labs and farms. And so, yeah, it's, they're a very admirable um, yeah. group of people. Fantastic. I think that's something that's really important because often when you give to a charity, it's kind of faceless and you want to help, but you also want to make sure that what you're giving is going to the right place. So it's really nice that you've actually been able to, you know, meet with them and, and see what yeah. they do. It's fantastic. Yeah. Lovely. Um, so Alika, um, we'll, we'll just come on to the last part of this section. Um, and I, as you said at the beginning, you have... Um, some issues with having good massages at home <laughs> so you uh, you identified for us that um something that crops up a lot with you know with baking and with cooking and also with setting up a market stall um is upper back pain shoulders and neck so we're going to have a look at that area today and hopefully um that will that will help you to um maybe teach Ari a few lessons about <laughs> how one yeah, has a massage a <laughs> fantastic so um I am going to bring Lucinda back on and we'll go through a quick demo of some self-massage techniques and stretches for the for those areas that you've identified. Um, if anyone has any questions for Elika, either about anything that she's spoken about, there are a multitude of things um, that you could choose from. So if you have any questions about anything Elika's mentioned or likewise about anything that we're showing in our demonstration, please feel free to drop us a message and we'll try and um, get back to anyone. Who has anything to say? Hopefully someone's got something. There's always an awkward yeah. silence when it comes to a Q&A. Luckily this is online so <laughs> we don't have to, no one has to actually put their hand up. But um, so Alika I'll, um, I'll drop you out and then we'll bring you back in at the end for uh, the Q&A session. Okay Fantastic. thank you so much. Hello Lucinda. Hello, wow, that was a very interesting uh, chat with Alika. Thank you, yeah. Alika, that was brilliant, yeah. Wow, lots of interesting topics there, so I hope everyone enjoyed that, I certainly did. Yeah, um, yeah really, really insightful. Um, okay, so 
as Claire mentioned, we're going to do a little bit of self-care now in the form of some stretches and self-massage for the neck and the shoulders, which can be a really um, tense area for a lot of people, especially if you're working at a desk and you're hunched over, or like Alika, you're doing baking and kitchen a lot of the time. So I'm just actually going to mute you, Claire. So I'll mute Claire, but Claire's going to... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Um, Claire's going to do demonstrate along alongside me, and um, obviously, again, if there's any questions at the end, just pop pop it in the feed. But the first thing we're going to do before we do anything is we're just going to take some really nice deep breaths in and out through the nose. And if you can, I want you to try and take those uh, breaths from the diaphragm. Now, the diaphragm, I'll just do that for you is just below the ribs. So it's sort of just above the stomach and just below the ribs. And you want to imagine that you're sort of inflating and deflating a balloon. So you're just opening up that space here. Rather than taking shallow breaths from this top area here, you're just taking long, slow breaths from the diaphragm. And this is really good to just stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Now the parasympathetic nervous system is something that stimulates our relaxation response. So breathing is so key in that respect. We just want to bring everything down, slow it all down, and breathing is a great way to do this. Okay, so I hope you've all taken a nice few deep breaths in and out. So we're going to start with our first stretch. So this is a lateral neck stretch and it stretches the, the side of the neck. So what I want you to do is tip your left ear to your left shoulder like so and just remember not, not to bring this shoulder up, keep this shoulder nice and relaxed while you're doing it and if you want to increase this stretch, if you're sitting down you can hold on to the chair and use a bit of traction, use the chair as a way to kind of put a bit of intensity through that neck area. And you can also increase this stretch further by using the other arm, by placing the hand on top of the head and just increasing that stretch even more. So you're bringing the head around. Now try not to crank the neck, try to almost use just the weight of the hand to bring the neck further into that stretch. You, you want to just do everything in a nice, easy fashion, no sort of sudden jolting. Okay, so we'll just take it now. If you take your head back to neutral, so slowly just bring your head back to neutral, we'll just take it to the other side. So again, we'll just tip now the right ear to the right shoulder. And again, if you're holding onto a chair, you can just use your arm to increase that stretch. And bring your hand over to just intensify that stretch. Fantastic. And these stretches can be hold, held for about 20 to 30 seconds. And also remember to breathe. It's it, We often completely forget to breathe when we're stretching. We're so concentrating so much on what we're doing that we forget to breathe. So just nice deep breaths in and out. Okay, perfect. So once you've done that, just bring your head back to neutral. And we're now going to do what's called the sternocleidomastoid stretch. So I want you to bring your left hand and put it under your collarbone. So you're, you're just resting under your collarbone. Now, if you jut your chin slightly forward and then rotate your head to the left, and you should already be starting to feel that stretch in your neck. But to intensify it more, you then tip your head back. So you're tipping your head back and you should feel that all through those front neck muscles and the sternocleidomastoid, which is this muscle here. Now, if, if you want to intensify this even more, you can pop your other hand on top of your left hand and draw your hands down so you're basically increasing the length of that area by putting a bit of pressure on both hands and you'll get an even longer 
a nicer set in that neck area. Now, this is fantastic for all those front scaly muscles, the cryomastoid uh, muscle, and also to help ease the jaw. We, we have a lot of tension in our our jaw we we often clench and hold tension in our jaw which can lead to tension headaches so it's fantastic to do in the whole area we'll just take it to the opposite side now so we'll just bring the hand to the opposite collarbone and jump the chin forward rotate to the right and tilt the head up and for even more Resistance, just bring that other hand on top of the other hand and pull down in a nice slow fashion. And remember to breathe because I nearly forgot then. So perfect. And again, hold it for 20 to 30 seconds and you can do it two or three times just to really ease those muscles. So I'll get Claire now to turn around because we're going to just do a little bit of uh, neck self-massage. So just so you can see her neck, she's just going to turn around on her chair. Great. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to locate the bony processes in the, in the center of the neck. So basically the vertebrae. So we just want to put our fingers on those bony processes. And then bring your fingers to either side of those bony processes. And that that's where we're going to massage. We're not going to massage on any of the spine or any of the bone. So that's where we're going to massage. And then if you just tilt your head forward slightly and starting at the top of the neck, I just want you to slowly rake your fingers through all that lovely flesh in the neck. So we're just going to do these raking movements through and we can go right down into the top of the shoulders and this is fantastic at releasing all that fascia and all that connective tissue that gets very very tense and we can do this for three or four times just raking through the neck and if you find an area that's really particularly sort of sticky or a bit tight you can just Stay on that area and just apply a little bit of pressure. So just, and you can also do small circular movements just to kind of release that tension spot. And yeah, I can really feel it anyway. I don't know about you guys, but that is, that is doing the job. Okay, and now I'll get Claire to turn around again for me. <sighs> Sorry, Claire. You are eternally moving. We're going to just move on to a few little bits for the shoulders. So we're going to do a really nice shoulder um, release. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring our shoulders right up to our ears. Squeeze, 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 squeeze. And you're doing this in an inhalation. And then with an exhalation, just let everything drop. Okay, we'll do that a couple more times. So a nice inhalation, we'll bring the shoulders up to the ears. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. And with an exhalation, drop. And you can do an audible exhalation. Just let everything go. Just, just be loose, be free. Do a little dance, you know. We just want to let everything loosen up a bit. Okay. So now what we're going to do is... Sorry, Claire, I'm going to get you to turn around again because we're going to just do some shoulder extensions. So, once Claire's turned around, okay, we're going to just clasp the hands behind your back, but like this, and we're just going to push those hands away from the body, okay? And while you're pushing the hands, make sure that you're basically drawing your shoulder blades down your back and then push your arms away from the body. So it's kind of like a, a, a like a, a, a yin and yang thing. You're pushing your shoulder blades down, but you're drawing your, your arms out. And that basically, what will that will do is that will start to open up the pectoralis muscles at the front. Now the pectoralis muscles 
are um, not often associated with uh, shoulder problems, but basically when we're sitting like this a lot, they get very, very short and tight and they start to compress and shorten. But by doing that stretch, we're opening up these pectoralis muscles and taking pressure off the back of the shoulders. So it's a really good stretch to just instantly release the shoulders. Okay, great. I hope you can see that because that's a really, really useful stretch. And now we're just going to take the arms and bring them in front of us. Again, clasping the hands together and push them away from the body. So we're pushing the arms away from the body. And at the same time, we're just going to bend the head forward and again, push the arms as, as far forward as you can, really. And imagine Imagine that you're drawing the shoulder blades away from each other. So you're basically creating space within in, in between the shoulders and you're drawing those shoulder blades away. And this will really just loosen up those shoulders for you. Fantastic. So hopefully you're feeling a, a little bit looser. You can do a couple of rolls of the shoulders forwards and backwards just to loosen it up a bit more for you. Okay. So now on to the massage section of the shoulders. Right, so we're going to just work on one side and then we'll swap to the other. But just the side that you're working on, just make sure your arm is nice and loose. We don't want to hold tension and it sort of moves up as we sort of try and work on it. So just make sure everything's nice and loose on that side. And we're just going to do some nice grabbing or squeezing of those upper traps and we're just going to work that right down over the shoulder joints and this will just really start to get the blood circulation in the shoulder and the top of the traps. We just really want to warm up the area before we start sort of digging into it. You can do this two or three times just to make everything feel nice and warm. Then we're going to take two fingers and we're just going to, the first two fingers, start to do small circular motions through those upper traps. And you can really sort of dig into the areas that feel a bit knotty. So knots are, are actually redundant muscle fibre. So it's basically muscle fibre that's fatigued, usually through overuse. So it, what it does, it basically prevents the full flexibility of that muscle and the full elasticity of that muscle. So as therapists, we want to try and break that down. So by doing these little friction moves on these areas, we start to break those redundant fibers down and it'll just give you more elasticity and flexibility within the muscle. And you can really, really dig in, but obviously just so it doesn't, you know, hurt, it feels it feels deep but not sort of painful. You don't want to be sort of tensing. So we'll just move on to the other side now so we'll just start by squeezing that grabbing that flesh getting all the blood flow into the area increasing the blood circulation helps to flush through sort of all the sort of toxins and it, it helps to increase oxygen into the area increase oxygen into the blood flow and just flush through all those nasty toxins that build up in our, in our shoulders so it's, it's really good to get that nice and warm and all the circulation going again okay and then we'll just take our two fingers and we'll just start to do the circular motions in those shoulders and just be wary you will feel those knotty tissue which feel hard and like like little clumps in the shoulders that's fine to massage, but just be wary not to massage the bony areas. We just don't don't massage sort of on, on, on the shoulder blade, the bone of the shoulder blade or on the spine. We just massage the soft tissue. So just be careful just to not, not go over any of the bone. And there we go. And then we're just going to finish off by rolling our shoulders forward. I can back and hear my crunching already. Taking a nice inhalation and bringing the shoulders up to the ears. And 
breathe. And a nice couple of deep breaths in and out. Perfect. Thank you very much. I, I know that was a, a very quick uh, neck and shoulder demo. But as we've said, if you do want to see some more tips and hints on how to, to do some things for yourself, we do have our Working for Home series, which is, is all on our YouTube. And we do have a few more little tips for self-massage of the neck and the shoulders and some extra stretches as well. But I hope that as a little lunchtime demo has uh, helped a few of you. Perfect. Thank you, Claire. Hope that was all right. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. I definitely felt a few bumps and knots and can you hear me yeah me too me too <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. cool my microphone has a tendency to um, dislodge when i'm swiveling around <laughs> cool so uh let's yes, sorry about that. no 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 <laughs> i'll bring um alika back in Hello. Hello, Elika. Hello. How was that for you? Amazing. Uh, I could have done another hour of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's short and sweet. We carry on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, is there anything that you um, got confused by? Anything that didn't quite work for you that you'd like to clarify? No, actually, um, I felt that um, one thing that I didn't do that actually does make a big difference is the breathing mm. because um when you don't breathe you're quite tense all your muscles are really tense and when i was doing it and uh when you start to breathe they actually relax themselves so yeah. it's like you're yeah. not fighting to get through them it's so, so yeah. funny how you can forget to breathe isn't it it's it's such a basic yeah. thing but you're just i suppose holding your breath is uh, something that we do when we're tense um, exactly. So when you hold your breath, it's it's a bit of a vicious cycle. But when you feel tense, you're more inclined to hold your breath, and you're just yeah. like uh, <laughs> stiff yeah, as a rock. I, I, was doing. I was kind of like, and then I kind of like paused on my in inhale. <laughs> it's like <laughs> actually, when you exhale, it all it makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it's so, it's so easy uh, to forget to breathe. Yeah. I I constantly have to remind myself to breathe. Um, but yeah. It's, yeah, it's so important. It just relaxes everything. So yeah, I agree. Absolutely. And they're very simple exercises, but they're so effective. I mean, even now, I feel the difference with that tiny little exercise. It's yeah, well, it's just taking a few minutes out of your day. I mean, I think. Like you said earlier, Alika, you know, you spend so much time on social media. I mean, I'm aware of the irony that we're on social media now, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but you spend so much time kind of looking down at your phone or your laptop. And maybe if you just took one of those hours or even a half an hour for a bit of self-care instead, you might find at the end of the day, you feel a lot better than if you'd been scrolling through Instagram or whatever, whatever yeah, the young people do these days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you calling us young people? <laughs> we're, very, we're very young. <laughs> it's TikTok <laughs> malarkey and whatnot. Oh yeah, true. I don't have a clue about that. So. I don't even know what it is. People, people mime things or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, guys, I'm aware that we've just gone over an hour, um, so. Um, I think people will probably be, if people have been watching, they'll be finished their lunch. Um, so we'll we'll start to wrap up. Um, thank you so much, Alika, for coming on and for talking to us. Um, the link that you can see at the bottom is the PayPal link. Um, if anyone has any questions for Alika or would like to order one of her beautiful cakes, and I have to say, I mean, I first met Alika when I went to my friend Gabby's birthday and she turned up with this creation, this work of art that I thought we shouldn't even cut into because it was so beautiful. <laughs> um, and she's also made a gorgeous cake for my parents, which I brought home, uh, I think last Christmas, two Christmases ago. Um, and, and it's very bespoke and personalized. So if, you know, if you wanted to, you can have a look at Alika's website and um, I'm sure she can talk you through what she's able to do at the moment during lockdown and how she could cater for anything that you might need um and of course the um 
the site for the charity, the HSI, is there. You can see it. Um, so it's um, www.hsi.org. So um, you can, if you if you aren't able to donate today to us via PayPal, you can go on there and find out more about HSI. Um, and of course, um, we also had Alika speaking about her her dad and the. Um, the website for the petition that you can sign is also available online. If you just go to um, Anushe Ashure, you can find out more about that and how you can help. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, Lucinda, Alika, do we, do, does anyone want anything to be brought up or mentioned before we no, bow I out? Think, I think that was a great session. Thank you. Um, yeah. The dogs didn't make an appearance today, unfortunately. My dog refused. Chickpea and noodle and soupy. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he said, I've had enough. I'm sick of being exploited uh, for my good looks. I feel the so. pain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for the good looks, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that really <laughs> Well, thank you so much, both of you. Um, that was really, really great. And um, if anyone hasn't been able to watch today, do feel free to watch back. It will be available on YouTube. Spread the word, spread the love, and stay safe, everyone. Stay, stay safe, yeah. Okay. Um, we'll be back in two weeks' time for our next self-care session, so um, stay tuned. Perfect. Okay, bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.